Charles Alexander, and I'm one of the directors, one of about eight, I think, directors of POG, which uh, sometimes uses the subtitle Poetry in Action, and sometimes doesn't, because we're just POG, you know, which doesn't really mean anything except a group of friends that got together way back in 1996 to start a poetry series that's been going ever since. And uh, if I could get other people who are directors of this organization to raise their hand. Okay, you can kind of see who they are. And also we make a point of being a safe space. So if you feel unsafe or threatened in any way, you can certainly talk to any of those people. Okay, I'm gonna give the official welcome that we do. And, but even before that, we missed you, mm -hmm. you know? We've been uh, pretty much on Zoom for two years and a little bit, and, and we did have um, an event at uh, the UR Salon, and I think there may be more in the future there. I'm pretty sure there will be. Good evening. I hope that you all are doing well. My name is Charles Alexander. I guess I don't have to say that again. Okay. Tonight, we are delighted to welcome two wonderful presenters, George Quasha and Andrew Perialli. POG would like to thank the following organizations and groups for their support. Arizona Commission on the Arts, Poets and Writers, the UA English Department, Arizona Quarterly, Chax Press, and also individual donors uh, we, we thank our patrons who give, um, I think it's $100 or more in a year, and our sponsors who give 50 or more. And those people are yourself, <laughs> Mary Ellen Bartholomew, Charles Bernstein, Cynthia Hoag, Jason Lagapa, Joan Larkin, Judith LaFay, Cameron Louie, Lisa Martin, John Melillo, Cynthia Miller, Tenny Nathanson, Nancy Quigg, Stephen Romaniello, Stephen Salmoni, Will Stanier, Richard Taffener, David Weiss, Karen Brennan, Cutthroat, a Journal of the Arts through, through Pam Ushuk, Reed Dixon, Lynn Finger, Anna Lambert, Little Red Leaves, Don Pendergrast, Heidi McDonald, ba Barbara Miller, Jameson Nonix, Oracle Retreat for Writers, Jenna Osman, Propolis Press, Anthony Sobeck, Maria Starr, and Susan Thackeray. If you are interested in helping us in, uh, to bring readings like this, and also to bring some workshops, and uh, we've done some small symposia, um, you can contribute. You'll find how to do that on our website, which is pogartstucson.org, or um, you can come see us at the front table and we can help you with that. I am reading something that was done over a year ago. So here it says our next upcoming reading is February 12th, which is not true. <laughs> our next upcoming reading is actually a reading we are co-sponsoring with Chax Press, and that is, and actually there are two, and they're both next week. One is Thursday, uh, April 28th, and that one is at the Steinfeld Warehouse, 101 West 6th Street, featuring uh, Kelsey Venata and Janet Rodney, and then the other is April 30th, Saturday, right back here, and features Nathaniel Tarn, who, um, if you don't know him, he's been part of the international poetry community for, I would say, something close to 65 years. And, at the conclusion of the reading, we'd love to have you uh, stick around for a little while and to ask any questions if you wish, and even just mingle if you wish. And we will have a more formal 10 minute maybe uh, Q&A period um, after both presentations too. Okay. I would also like to acknowledge the indigenous peoples of all the lands that we call home Tucson, where Pog is based, is the ancestral home of the Tohono O'odham and Pasquayaki nations. We'd ask that we please take this moment to reflect on how 
in the wake of a history of violence and dispossession, we can move forward in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. And I, I think that hope goes even beyond simply the history of the communities here, but in a general way, and certainly as we emerge from um, a period where there maybe wasn't quite as commu much communication, certainly not face-to-face -face as there is now, and there will be. Okay, so I also have the pleasure of introducing George Quasha, and which is kind of a, Awesome. I mean, I think I've known uh, something about George almost as long as I've known and been involved with contemporary uh, poetry and literature as the editor of America Prophecy in the late 60s, an inspirational uh, book he co-edited with Jerome Rothenberg, and open poetry, and also in journals uh, that he founded and edited and eventually his publishing work with Station Hill Press, which has published some of the most, I think, moving and exploratory writers and artists of the last 40 years. He's also an artist and a musician. He has many books, including Poetry in Principle, Essays in Poetics, Zero Point Poiesis is a book about George Quasha's axial art. His ongoing video work was received a Guggenheim Fellowship, principally for Art Is, Music Is, Poetry Is, for which he has recorded over a thousand uh, portraits, really, uh, video portraits of artists, poets, and composers in 11 countries saying what art, music, or poetry is. And you can also find that work online and listen to uh, a lot of hours of it. Um, okay, I'm not gonna read every other title he's published. Uh, I just wanted to say um, he's been working for some years. Cynthia's holding a book up in back. I think she wanted me to mention I Knew Dreams. No, I just wanted to mention that Which she loves. We these books. We have some. Yes, we have books for sale at the table. Um, he's been working on a, a series of works that have been published in several books called Preverbs. Um, I haven't actually asked him what he means by preverbs, but to me, he's kind of doing a, 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 a mixture of proverb, of um, of previous to the verb, and kind of a play on reverb, too, as though something whose vibrations stay with you. And I do think they do stay with you, because in these pieces, which are, um, at least in the most recent volumes, you know, one page long for each entry, and then arranged in several sections that, that would be several pages, and every line is a kind of statement, but saying it's a statement isn't quite right because there's something in just about every one of them that tw twists or torques some point of the language so that it becomes other and it holds you with that line. So you want to stay there a moment and figure out often the one, two, three, or four possible meanings that might come out of that twisting the language, or as, as people have been saying for the last 20 years or so, kind of querying the language in a way uh, that allows, I think it, that allows something in your mind as you go through that to, to, to be let in. Um, uh, I've been talking with George Quasha all day today, and there was a lot of talk about how, you know, so many of the things we do from art to uh, moving with our bodies uh, is done best if we don't think of it as making things happen, but allowing them to happen, discovering them as they're happening. And so I think there's going to be some discovering going on here in the next half an hour or so. Please welcome George Quasha.
Chill this thing on. One, two, three. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, wow. Great. Suddenly I feel big. <laughs> Let me get the water here. I'm huge. <laughs> well, that was so, that was, that would have been intimidating what he said if it wasn't so inspiring to me. So here's somebody actually understand what I'm doing so well. Um, I'll talk about preverbs in a, in a, in a moment, but I, can I see, everybody see me? Because uh, 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 Cynthia has come up, you can't come up here, can you? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I wanted you nearby. Um, uh, having mentioned Ainu dreams, it, I, I think I should read some of them because it's one thing they're easier to hear <laughs> than, than the preverbs are. But this is a thank you. I need I need all the support I can get. <laughs> I just spent a marvelous afternoon with partly in the desert. Um, that's why I'm so red. I'm not the real me. Uh, I've been absorbing your son here. And um, and then I had a wonderful time in the afternoon with Cynthia's incredible art in her studio. Anybody who doesn't know that, you should find out about it because it's really, really special, beautiful work. I knew Dreams, the project that I made, I hate calling it a project, but it actually was something like that. Uh, we had a Japanese artist living with us named uh, Chie Hasegawa. She's now named Chie Hammonds. Um, but she lived with in our, on our property for a number of years. And in the, about four years into her living there, um, she told me a dream that was mind blowing. And I said, I've known you all these four years and you've never mentioned a dream, but this is an incredible dream. And so she said, well, I don't dream. I don't remember my dreams. I said, but you did, and this is incredible. I said, you have to remember your dreams now because you're a dreamer and there aren't that many dreamers of that quality. So uh, magical dreaming, almost shamanic dreaming. So she said, well, I can't do it. She said, but the next day she came and said, I had a dream. <laughs> and she told me the dream and I said, look, I'm, I wrote it down. I said, we've got a project. We've got to work together. Because you dream, I write. Because she's Japanese, she reads prolifically in English and Japanese, but naturally she doesn't speak and write English like a native. So she, I performed a certain function in that equation. So the first one of these is the dream I wrote down that day. So maybe I'll stand up a little bit because I feel like I'm not seeing everybody. Sorry, now I'm going to probably make a mess here. Drop everything down. So it's called The Fool. The Fool in black misfit tights came up to me and said, everything is one half comedy and one half comedy <laughs> and handed me with his two hands, his two heads. I thought, whoa, <laughs> this is one of those really special things. So I, I'll read you a few of these because they're, they're really, really fun. can't turn pages. Um, so, nest living. At the top of this tall, leafless tree, crutched in the bare branches, there's a nest. And I and my big bird call it home. I myself am a bird from the waist down our mostly white but partly blue feathers cover the nest quite comfortably and we are warming a blue-green egg he the bird my husband does it a while and then i do it a while i am happy 
I feel responsible. We are collaborating beautifully. <laughs> Journeying. Lying on my back, this long, long hair of mine flows behind me and becomes a road leading to a huge and special place. This is, only po this is the only possible way to get there. So people start walking, heading out on my hair, on the lengthening journey along the road. And I warn them to take off their shoes. Yet, incredibly, some just keep on walking. I start to get angry. Sorry I ever invited them at all. Still, I realize that I alone am responsible for getting them there. Meanwhile, people are arriving, and already they have begun to do this very particular body movement, which can only be done in a certain state. And one by one, they disappear. The dreams also have a kind of ominous quality, you might say. <laughs> it's very funny. Also, I didn't really know that dreams could be funny in quite that degree, you know. I mean, you remember any dream that you had that you were laughing? I actually, once I thought about it, could remember one or two, but she had many. Here's one called Philosophical Immunity. I was in the closet and realized that someone was trying to stick needles in my skin. So I decided to gather together the complete works of Socrates and wear them as armor. Now, no one can get at me. Suddenly, the idea comes into my mind that I should be doing the exact same thing with Nietzsche and Sartre. <laughs> I know, it's amazing. And here's one, a related one. Also, she's not a particularly philosophical person or a thinker, you might say, but there's a lot of thinking that happens in these poems. It's quite amazing. Um, this one actually reminds me of my own mind. Uh, a logic of two kinds. There are two kinds of people, those who catch and those who pitch. Then there are those who hit. I remember you said, there are two kinds of people, those who can catch and those who can't. I catch, so I decided to become one who hits. <laughs> okay, there's one more I think I'll read. Oh, this one, I, I love this one. I found a way. I found a way to be awake all the time. It's so easy and evident. I just start doing it, and instantly I know everything. I say to myself, this is how you become everything. I turn to the guy sitting next to me, and without hesitation, I show him how. Easy, isn't it? Try it sometime. Okay. Now for the hard stuff. Um, so a preverb. That was great, actually. Um, yeah, there are a lot of things that I, I, I can't say about them, <laughs> or that I try to say about them, but they were inspired by Proverbs, but by William Blake's Proverbs of Hell, and they were they're the kind of Proverbs that kind of it's like on your computer, you, you hit delete, and suddenly it's not there anymore on the screen. This is like del every time every, everyone deleted a hundred previous proverbs <laughs> every, of, of William Blake, and so that, that was an inspiring thing. Uh, a, an example would be, no bird flies too high, that no bird soars too high, no, no bird flies too high, no bird flies too high that soars on its own wings. You know, this notion that there's an intrinsic self-regulation, an idea that appeals very greatly to me, which I think is actually the profound truth of, of everything. That everything is self-regulating, but we don't let it. We boss it around and make it do, make it dance like a trained seal. And then but that's what happens. So Proverbs try to say what's true. 
because they believe that you can say what's true and have it stick. Preverbs don't do that. They try to say what can't be said and leave it that way. Leave it, un leave it out of respect, leave it unsaid. So, it basically comes down to that understanding is way overrated. So you won't have too much problem with that. <laughs> um, so each book has seven series. Um, series can be a few poems or they can be uh, 34 poems. I mean, this book, most of them are up to 34 poems in the series. And, um, but the, there are two, the only rules are that it can't, a line can't go over the edge of the line defined it, like Microsoft Word. So it has to stop. And the second thing is a poem can't go more than a page. So those are the only two rules. And, and it's, it's kind of anti-symbolic form, like a sonnet means something culturally to you as already, if the sonnet you think it means something that it's already, just the fact that the guy was able to write it or the moment was able to write it means that it has a kind of significance. Well, this is the opposite. It has no significance whatsoever that it's one line or, or a whole page or, or any number of things. It's more like a glass. You, you fill the glass and you stop when the wine gets to the top or the water gets to the top. That has no meaning. It's just there's no more space for it. That's it. So I, I wanted a form that was just that down to earth because nothing else about it is down to earth. <laughs> so, so this one is called Eternal Discomfort of the Heavenly Bent. And it's dedicated actually to Kimberly Lines and Veet Bakaitis. So I'm, I'm going to do something I've never done before with these. I'm just going to read uh, several of them in, 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 in line uh, because there's no significance whatsoever to their sequence except that they were actually written that way and um, when I read them over I mean if I, I prepared for this reading strenuously by opening the book to that place and that deciding that I would read that so after that kind of rigor I couldn't refuse to read five of them if I can get that far. So each one has a title and, and they're, they're numbered. So these will be the sequential ones. Eternal, this is one, and this is the title poem actually, Eternal Discomfort of the Heavenly Bent. Out here in the space whose name is on the verge of showing a pulse, I'm in a state of panic and I'm taking to the page. My words are numbered like my days, but with less accumulation than bounce. Yet my days are flooding behind and the words are flowing ahead. This is the spread. The dance of death and the dance of birth are getting it on. Gypsy flamenco dancer spits on watchers, slinging her dying song. In the economy of always last words, I'm betting the house on the breath. The only emotion sustained comes with conviction unconvincing, a notch up. We've passed the point where seduction contains. Time to scale the page, repelling from line to line. The poem returns to teach the mind self-conversing language with a hitch. Polylinguality is mixing in the roots. It ties your tongue to a toothy twist, resuscitating mouth to mouth not getting sucked into canon construction. It's more anti-church than anti-war driven. Or maybe not. 
The avant-garde is block by block and alphabet showing. Every island is a man and gendered oceanic. Intelligence encloses. I'm inside mind where thoughts draw down. Thinking weathers. Not sure how we got here, but everything is getting pulled into place. Two, living at a distance. Duck, the lines are coming from all angles. Reading is covert action for an unknown collection agency. Paying dues as saying does. Language is repelling communication in favor of self-unmarked communique. Love this movie life. Hate the movie. Can't wait for the end. Over too soon. I'm tracking history a line at a time by the nanopulse. Timeline follows radial, trying to keep up with film fate radical. Numbers where calculation and angelic incursion stare each other to a standstill. Stand with the greats to keep your ego in place. Quote, art neurosis is the consequence of teaching according to people's opinions, unquote. Clearing the issue up is also out and away. Expect confusion. Words switch frames. Brain is a dwarfed synecdoche for mind. Pray next life to be a brainy bitch of an indeterminate color, codename Dakini. This is a disguise for willfully fluctuant gender in the Klein bottle wild. Scent wins. Jump around with me and fling your spitting image straight up. Akashic note-taking scratches a future like cave wall racehorse in the third. Trust only what's out of school. The attack is over my head. The content is none of my business. Poems now a sight awarding points for a good fumble. Defining good. The aim is loosing true anarchy. Think, think. I've got this object-like entity on my tongue, turning itself into a word flow. Its racket synthesizes colorfully and with just enough surface friction to turn on. Like turning on a dime. Turning to proto-sublime, ringing rhyme from comfort tone. Tongue learns to love the things it does worst. Therefore, no therefore. If I call you here as real, I take you apart to a part. Self is only a theory. Eternal return is the intensive vision of infinite variation. Either way, you don't see it happening. Language is a placeholder with holes, and the trick is holding the place hole open. Everything pulses in the grand audition. We're talking skin here. I am absolutely, concretely sure. Skip telling me who I am and I you. Name transports identity. 
Think paramecia or the moth that sounds psychotic. Biologos is rough going and at a given point has a sound as poignant as synth. It's equal to an opening in the rainforest, a field of fungi, a zone clear to gather in. It's proverbial if autotropic, makes its own food. Nurture words up from under time. Mind twist, word torque, letteristic turn into paramecia, or words oblong alongside. The translation is the ride inside more surface than psychosis. We're coming up for air, bearing in breath the thing we wish to show up. So, uh, I'm going to skip to five. We're running out of time here. Am I out of time? Well, I don't no. think you actually started until at least. This time out of me? 20 after, so no, you've got 15 more minutes if you need it. I can't hear you. You do have something like 15 more minutes if you want. Oh, wow. I, I don't think I can stand up that long. No, <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> okay, five. I'll read one more here, and then I'll read maybe two points in this book, and that'll be it, okay? So, hold on. <laughs> Five. Cleaving in principle. I see the line... Oh, sorry. Sorry again. I tow the line that tows the words up a hill of beans for a meaning to come. What's happening is absolute until interpreted. What matters but to put it on the line? Innuendo intended with coming suspended. Poetry makes no promise to keep you feeling good. Bad either. I draw the line to make self-reworking syntax face free to hold the chaos. It talks about itself the way you talk about yourself, so you know you're still there. Meanwhile, it's looking for its other name. Still, names make no promise to be who is said. Longing attracts all new escape routes. Homesickness is a withdrawal symptom in a life of addiction to life. Escapism hacks the operating system to mess with mother code. What you call esoteric, I call hide and seek. Discomfort, or rather non-comfort, pervades the holy land imagined. It wants me reading from the gaps. Going to sit right down and write myself a letter and make believe it came from you. I decline reclining on the hit bottom. Time to kick the habit on the edge of the rabbit hole. I'm learning to get the feel of the up updraft locating the way to say. Its only promise is keeping going. Any moment practices showdown. The line on the edge of the rabbit hole is because the name of the book is Not Even Rabbits Go Down This Hole. Okay. Got, got through that still standing. So I'll read two from, from this book. This book is the new book that's just come out. It's called Waking from Myself, What you're supposed to say when you hear that is, good luck with that. <laughs> 11. Some like it not. 
good line says, you've never read right before this moment. It lies. Still not reading, reading. It's not no good, but good is the wrong idea. Note how poem is having the feel of eternity in the grammar of backflow. It's drawing on a poetics where defects become as virtuous as the breath is long. At times, as the hour strikes, relative and absolute at once. Alarm. Complete sudden ballet in the face signifies character showing with elan. A throw from the heart, a stone's throw from home. Two things as seriously as they take themselves, taking the curve. The gesture is, is equilibrational with its edge. No time to plan in no time. Waiting has no outside while still writing. We're always on the move out here, far from home. It's a bit shaky. No likes more than you dare think. Guessing who says these things proves undistracted. Only can follow the track you're on track on. Only can follow the track. Secretly saying, talk to me, turns on worlds scarcely sensed. Syntactic nuance is tonal and facial. I'm on the way to your way is the one thing you feel your way. The distinction is never free of extinction. You hear a turbulence, slide under. What's undeniable is the fact we're both here now, or it's not happening. So, last one. Last one. From rags to raga. Uh, most of you will know that raga is uh, uh, a term covering a special kind of rhythmic sense in uh, Indian music. We often speak of the music as raga. And uh, I listen to a lot of raga. So from rags, to, oh, it's all improvisational too. That's the other thing to say about it. It's a kind of music that is entirely in its whole nature improvisational from ancient times. From rags to raga. True response is what could be without saying when. Figure coming to being with full force of origin figures forth fresh, now on the move. Now, yeah, now, now the more, sorry. Right. Lingual learning gets poetic in altering your capacity to degrade by ripening. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything. Darkens. Figuring primary is well-versed summary execution. I'm talking scenario, se scenario sevens in search of an auteur. The base struggle is to get your taut tongue taut. Am I getting things backwards? Questions haunt and taunt in no order. Response is syntactic executive non-decision. Construction implies induction followed by execution. One can only follow so far until farther. Any statement fails in the long run or else in curved runs. What's hard is following between. Fun too. 
I'm more distracted than anyone just having to say this. I get stranger every day, according to myself. Looking in the mirror, I see why revolutions fail. What if I told you every line interns for absolute truth differently? Graduation is a limiting concept. Whereas non-graduation unlimits ungradually. Multiple negatives are positively negative. Long lived line, long lived long lines occur like longing lives a letter at a time. Self-assured criticism tells us we're who we want to be, at least for now. Thank you. Uh, with a pretty amazing studio in Tucson Mall. And uh, she's just doing incredible things. And she has yeah, a long relationship in the puppetry community has known Andrew Periales, my brother's work for a long time. So I thought she would be a good person to introduce him. Go for it, Lisa. Thank Lisa you. Stern. <laughs> Lisa. Thank you. Well, it is an honor to introduce you to my friend and colleague of almost 50 years, Andrew Periales, because he's a really big deal. I'll tell you, he... Um, well, over the years, I've delighted in the imaginative, award-winning performances of Perry Alley Theater that Andrew does with his wife. She's great, Bonnie, <laughs> love her. I relish the late nights at national puppetry conferences, playing music, singing, and exchanging little tricks of the trade. As founding editor um, of the magazine Puppetry International, Andrew is loved and admired and well-known in the puppet community. We look forward to his kind of witty, impromptu skits and poetry at some of our late night potpourries. <laughs> but Andrew's poetry has appeared in Light Quarterly, Yellow Medicine Review, Burnt Bridge, as well as numerous anthologies and a lot of Andrew's work is for sale back there. He's a longtime member of City Hall Poets in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. He also served four years as Poet Laureate in Rochester, New Hampshire. So poetry and puppetry. I often use that puppetry is to theater what poetry is to prose. Puppetry speaks with visual metaphors and meaningful gestures. In Periality, Periality's production of Snow White, a cereal box becomes a prince, and a wine bottle with a, a mechanical corkscrew is the evil queen. So Andrew combines puppetry and poetry with gentle dexterity, insight, and humor. We're so lucky to have Andrew performing his magic here in Tucson. And here's Andrew Periali from Stratford, New Hampshire. I must start for Paris immediately. The city's alive as Stratford, New Hampshire is not. It's teeming with baguettes and gypsies with crepes and Algerians. Music erupts from the subway and saltenbanks caper at Saint Pompidou. Ancient manuscripts amble alongside the Seine and cathedrals are haunted by hunchbacks. In Stratford, New Hampshire, we have three small churches, all Baptist. We have half a lake and no pastries, unless you count whoopie pies wrapped up in cellophane down at the general store. But Paris, I'm packing my suitcase with espadrilles and tiny underpants. <laughs> then I will fly to you, fly homing in on a bright Eiffel Tower, the smell of gitans. <laughs> In Stratford, New Hampshire, are many small graveyards. It's easy to picture the citizens slumbering there neath their headstones. But Paris, your Père Lachaise, buzzing with visitors, rowdy with revelers, always the spirits run high. And that's what I need, to live. Live. 
live in your bars, to run with your clandestine sewer cinephiles, your milfeuille and croque monsieur, uh, gargoyles, grandguignol, guillotines. Someday soon, I will sell my house. Honey, I'll say, kiss your family goodbye. We're leaving the land of the sugar maple and peach, the, the bear and the beaver. We're off to the land of bourgeois and pommes frites. We're selling the cars and the cats, your art books and icons, my childhood collection of stamps. Bring your paints and my poems. We must start for Paris, for Paris, for Paris. We must start for Paris immediately. Thank you. So, um, welcome to uh, a selection of pieces from my solo show, Mono a Monologue. Um, I guess I do uh, push the form a little bit, but. Well, for a solo puppeteer, everything's a monologue, really, if you think about it. So, here we go. There's some puppets, some props, some costumes, some poetry, if, if I may dignify it with that name. This next one um, was inspired by a, an, an item, an entry on a Chinese takeout menu. It's called... Celestial Surprise. <clears throat> she left me. Seven years without a hitch, and boom! Said she needed to get closer to God. I think she needed to get farther from me, that's what I think. Closer to God. That's well, not so unusual nowadays. Seems like everybody's looking for God, goddess, guru. But was I stopping her? closer to God. You want to try something original? Try getting farther from God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get as far from God as I can. It's absurd. If God is omnipresent, omniscient, there is no escape. <laughs> omniscient. Yeah. Nice work if you can get it. Still, I don't know. Maybe it wouldn't be so nice to know everything. I mean, there'd be no more surprises, because well, you'd already know. When I think of all the things that fill me with awe and wonder, the, uh, the birth of a child, workings of the human brain, the orbits of planets, the migratory patterns of monarch butterflies, the Secrets of really great lasagna? Well, there'd be no mystery, no surprise. I wonder if God has ever been surprised. Maybe once, back when everything existed as a single point and all of a sudden, Boom! Giant cosmic fart that sends everything blowing apart at the speed of light. And I mean everything. The, the, the cosmic dust that became planets and suns and uh, rivers, mountains, me, her. Yeah, yeah maybe God was surprised then. Hey, that'd be the ultimate. If I could throw a surprise party for God. Of course, if I could surprise God, it'd either mean God wasn't omniscient or God wasn't, God wasn't. I don't believe that. I just don't believe you can get closer to God. Like God is going to come walking up to me on the street and, and, and start speaking in English. What's the matter? 
think I can't speak English? <laughs> well, I, I've been wrong before. <laughs> You're telling me. So, you are God, the one and only. Surprise! I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> hey, hang on a second. How do I know that you're the one true God? You want to test me? Well, not exactly. I just know it makes perfect sense. Go ahead. Ask me a question. Well, what sort of question? I don't know. Anything. What do you really want to know? Did she really leave me in order to get closer to God? I mean, you? Partly. Well, why else? Because you're a big grumpy puss most of the time and it was really bringing her down? Couldn't she have said something? Sorry, you've had your question. Hey, wait a minute. You didn't tell me anything I didn't already know deep down inside. Yeah, that's the point. See, you're getting closer to God already. But I, hey, woo, God? Oh, oh. Thank you. Uh, I've never tasted celestial surprise. I don't know what's in it, but that was it for me. That was one of the prosier pieces, but since it was, they used a picture in the publicity, I thought I. I thought I ought to do it. Um, this next one is called The Interrogator. And it was written in a three-day workshop on the poetic monologue taught by a guy named David Mason. And as I showed him my first draft, he's like, well, what are all these little notes on the side? Like for stage directions. He's like, no, 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 this is a, a poetic monologue. But I already knew I was going to perform it. Mm. Uh, please. It's all right. You're here now. That's over. And I apologize for the behavior of our agents, some of whom are young. They're... They fight like curs for scraps of flesh. They're over-anxious and maleducato. Huh? Uh, I've got something you're going to like. You've got a fine eye for detail. And craftsmanship like this is hard to find these days. Huh? Oh, I'm sorry about the strip of tape across your mouth. We've had complaints about the noise. Ah, I see that's caught your eye. Well, don't worry. In all my years, I've never had to use the saw. It's funny how I keep it handy just in case. You know, we're not so very different, you and I. We both love cars. Have been to university. Have the necessary fencing scars, huh? That's important. This is no place for the uh, faint-hearted. Hmm. Oh, here's one. <laughs> Tuning fork in the white keys of smile. A griffin's claw. A magic mirror. Oh, I've upset you. I thought you'd be impressed, but I forget. I'm here, you're there, and fair or not, I have a job to do. And you, well, <clears throat> you have something that I want. A story, a, a tale full of characters and plots. I suppose you want to know how this will go. These things unfold the hard way or the easy way. Now, the hard way, and this, this baffles me. It always comes first, but that's up to you. So, as you are mute, I'll 
ask questions. You have but to uh, nod at places, dates, names, above all, names. Eh? <laughs> so let's begin. What will it take for you to open up a toe, a fingernail? I know one thing, the time will tell, and so will you. And that's that. <laughs> I don't, it's a, it's a dark thing. But we're going to lighten it up right now. <clears throat> with a piece called um, The Hapless Bride. Do you know the word Salma Gandhi? Anyone? Well, Salma Gandhi is a, um, <clears throat> it's a collection of things. Uh, Washington Irving started a literary journal called Salma Gandhi, right in, in your neighborhood, sort of. Um, but it comes from a kind of chopped salad where each little item is in its own place. Uh, and Sal McGundy, well, I had a friend named Henry who was a sculptor. His daughter lined up a solo show for him at a, a gallery in Brooklyn called Sal McGundy. Uh, Henry told me he thought it was the owner's name. So in his honor, I wrote The Hapless Bride. <clears throat> Sal Magundi immigrated from, um, from uh, Scotland to New Scotland, Nova Scotia, as many of them did. That's, I guess, all you need to know. At the utmost reach of the Bay of Fundy, just above the tide, lived a pretty girl named Sal Magundi, Shane Magundi's bride. Newly come from near Loch Gyle for a husband sight unseen, her heart grew light when she saw him smile and knew he weren't mean. They worked all day and loved all night and plied the trade of weaver. He cried, Egad, you know you're plaid, and swore he'd never leave her. And they were happy too for a year and a day when he sailed to Provincetown. But word came back of a storm on the bay and a boat that had gone down and Sal Magundi, sent for Lord beyond what words can tell, swam out in her dear Shane's kilt and sporn and sank beneath the swell. When Shane came home on another boat, he cried, Oh, you be fool! Did you not ken that you wouldn't have float all dressed in pelts and wool? <laughs> the looms are stilled. The little plot of land is now all grown. Sadly, Shane found that he could not weave well enough alone. <laughs> Each night he walks down to the bay and toasts his hapless bride, who came in on St. Mungo's Day and went out with the tide. Oh. All right. Uh, this next one is called I Think of You. You have to use your imagination here a little bit. I've constructed what works uh, for me a little bit as a chaise longue, right? The, what we used to call the chase lounge. And this is the story of a middle-aged British housewife who for the first time in her life finds herself by herself on a tropical holiday. <sighs> yes, dear, it's true. I think of you the entire time. The weather is sublime, warm breezes, but not hot. The pleasant tang of ocean in the air, 
At 2 p.m. each day, a shower followed by a rainbow of such mythic beauty that I think of you, dear man, you know I do. The food here is fabulous. Mangoes, tree ripe, fresh picked, mounds of shrimp and coconut, and little drinks brought out to my chaise longue by Jean Lou, so that I may bibulously raise a glass to you and think how you'd adore it here. And with each sip, I picture you chasing some bird or butterfly, bright wings splayed like jazz hands, not unlike. Jean Lou's fingertips, feather light, releasing my earthbound shoulder blades to flight, oh, giving the boot detention built up over our decades of cooking, cleaning, ironing your bloody socks. Oh, how intently, darling, do I meditate on you. I know that you would be here if you could, though. Not with me, of course. With one Miss Laura Keats. Oh, how she lit up your office with her laughter, her brightly colored plumage, her, her cheap, cheap, cheap perfume. <laughs> I found the tickets just after your tumble down the stairs. Or was it just before? Oh, the memory's a funny thing, but never mind. They couldn't be returned, so one for me, one for ashes in an urn, to which I dumped, dear Roger, in a small lagoon. <laughs> Thank heavens for your pension and your life insurance. Thank heavens for your foresight and your coin collection. No, I shout your name out to the blameless sky, dear Roger. Roger, Roger, Roger! <laughs> In Afterglow, I give jean Lou a hefty tip. I wonder if he'd like your pocket watch. He's unleashed something wild in me, and as you'd say, better late than never. No, he isn't clever, but he'll do. So, dear Roger, as you rest in peace, please rest assured, I think of you. All right, let's see. Is anyone here familiar with the uh, Martha Graham's choreography for seraphic dialogue? Anyone know? Well, the next time you're on YouTube, look it up. <clears throat> this piece was inspired by that. It's called Seraphic Monologue. <clears throat> My wife and I uh, placed all our hopes in some strange angel. The customary avenues had not borne fruit, neither working hard, nor being good, nor investing wisely, nor the master's degree in something practical. We uh, found our angel on eBay. It had served a discalced monk for decades. Now on his deathbed, the ancient friar uh, was auctioning off his angel for the benefit of the impoverished order, that had long since sold off everything, not nailed to a cross. <laughs> Our angel arrived on a Saturday. It floated through the kitchen wall, assumed the lotus posture up on top of a fridge, and muttered what we took to be an, a, a cheery greeting in a language we could not understand, and seeing our confused looks, said, I just flew in from Byzantium, and boy, are my wings tired. My wife shot me a look as if to say, Mister, this was your idea. Um, can we, um, can we get you anything? You'll find I am low maintenance. No food, no drink, no pool, no pets. Uh -huh. uh, 
What do you do? Do? What are your features? I'm an angel, not an iPad. Then, perhaps it took pity on us. I convey a certain blessing. A week and a half later, Seraph still is perched atop the old blue Kenmore, seldom speaks except when spoken to, and then turns everything into a joke. What is the difference between cherubim and seraphim? They got the buns. We got the looks. Check out these cheekbones, huh? Three months later, our fortunes have not improved one bit. I say we put them back on eBay, I whispered to the wife one night in bed. Why? It isn't hurting anything. It isn't costing us a cent. Make back our investment? Is that all you care about? The money? Whatever. But that stung. Now, after that, the seraph seemed to favor her. The difference was subtle. Day after day, though, the gap between us seemed to grow. She'd get choice freelance gigs. My workshops would be canceled thanks to snow. Act of God, the sponsor said. Yeah. She'd uh, show up in a brand new dress, new earrings. I would need a root canal. The seraph looked at her a certain way. Also, she had begun to pray. You should try it sometime. It wouldn't kill you. I'd grunt, go back out to look for work. Arriving home late one night, I found the seraph gone. Living room? My porch. Huh. Bedroom. Yeah, there it was, up on top of the chiffero. My wife was seated on the floor, bathed in a bluish glow. She pulled me from the room. I moved him in here. The fridge was so undignified. I put the bed down in the basement. You'll sleep there now. Well, I, I don't get it. What's he got that I have not? Can you dance on the head of a pin? Fine. I'll see you downstairs later. Of course, I never did. Never again the marriage bed. Never again would she wear shoes or socks. She seldom makes a sound except when laughing at his jokes. I could have become bitter, run away, remarried. I tend the garden now, run the household, pay the bills for all the money that she earns, Lord knows from where. I still know nothing about God. Nothing about the reasons that we're here or why we live or die and nothing about prayer and next to nothing about angels. I am a patient gardener and go barefoot now, except, you know, when spading. She may be inside absorbed in prayer or steeped in online trading. Who knows? We each have found our way, which I suppose is what we had in mind when we first bid upon our seraph. Hmm. Thanks. Just got a couple more. Um, I did a number of uh, short little character sketches some time ago. Some of them seem to fit into this, this Salma Gundy. Um, one of them is called Tinsley Tucker. Tinsley Tucker was a talker, and she liked to speak her mind. Wasn't any way to make her say what she could not defend. At town meeting, she was active, and she didn't suffer fools. Always voted no for gambling. Always voted yes for schools. Then a bounder came to town, as handsome as the day was long. Wooed her with his curly mustache. Won her with a cowboy song. True, he smoked, though she abhorred it. And he drank a bit too much. The mustache, she adored it. And she melted at his touch. 
Her principles she swallowed whole, battered it in tartar sauce, mm -hmm. and it was a bitter meal with aftertaste of albatross. Her principles would not lie still and silently began to grow. No one really noticed till about the seventh month or so. <laughs> then loose tongues began to wag and ugly rumors did abound. The cat was surely out the bag. Tinsley Tucker gotten round. By the time a year was out, the rumor mongers changed their tune. Miss Tinsley T, without a doubt, was looking like the harvest moon. Her parents took her out each day and tethered Tinsley to a stake, fearful that she'd float away if by some chance the rope should break. When she stopped fitting through the door, they'd float her each night to the barn and double tire to be sure with skeins and skeins of colored yarn. One night, she finally did admit it. She'd been blind to things she hated. A great weight from her heart was lifted. By the morning, she deflated. Tinsley Tucker's still a talker, and she loves to speak her mind. But when judging others' morals, she's more likely to be kind. Mm -hmm. Sorry, announcement about merch, the stuff that I've got back there, which is uh, unlike George. This is the totality of my, my publishing career, at least in, in poetry. Um, and again, like everything else I do, my partner in this has been Bonnie. We have a little imprint called Sparhawk Press. Uh, Sunday, this Sunday at Adele's. Adele's is a local coffee house. I don't know about you, but I've done some of my best work in coffee houses. Uh, Uncommon Ground, poetry written in and about the cafe. This theme. Striking thumbnails. Pithy portraits of people you haven't met yet. Um, Tinsley Tucker is one of, the, one of those. And finally, Mono a Monologue, um, which has a number of the pieces that you saw tonight, as well as something you didn't see. Um, I was down to my last two books, so Bonnie and I, in a heroic effort, um, had some more printed off, and we, we had to tie the covers on by hand because there wasn't any time to have them bound. Uh, I think it cost four dollars and ninety-seven cents a piece. I'm selling them for five bucks, so this is this is a deal. Um, there's also um, this was kind of a Tucson project. My CD, uh, Woody Boy Johnson. He's a kind of a fake cowboy. Um, the the album is called. Uh, Three easy chords and a hard one. Um, so there are these kind of twisted songs I wrote for this alter ego of mine, Woody Boy Johnson, cover and uh, notes designed by my wife, Bonnie, who did all the artwork in these books as well. So there you go. Um, this was recorded largely in Tucson with many local celebrities, Bill Martin, uh, Mindy Ronstadt, Bill Ronstadt, uh, Ralph the Wonder Drummer, Gilmore. Anyway, um, so a little piece of local culture as well as some darn fine and uh, smile producing music. Okay, so the last piece is called An Uncle's Advice. And I'll bet some of you have an uncle like this in your family. An older gentleman who's led a really interesting life and now can't help giving advice to his younger nieces and nephews, whether they want it or not. All right, you wanna know the truth? Go to Naples in your youth. Travel gives you things that can't be bought, and while your skin is smooth and taut, is when you ought. When some old duffer greets you with a frown and says it's time to settle down, run to Barcelona if you dare, while love is cheap and everywhere, while you still have all your hair, go to Paris. Study mime, the Frenchies do it all the time. Pack up all your cares and woes, 
Well, you still look great without your clothes. Well, you still can touch your toes. Go to Rome and study art and meet someone who'll break your heart. A boy whose ass is like twin moons. A girl whose spirit's light as helium balloons. Then spend a night out on the dunes. Life won't wait for anybody's dream and only flows one way, downstream. So when your friends see Rome, well-heeled, successful, gray, and no one looks their way except the waiter, cab driver, valet, you will know that you were there when life was sweet, that you played music in the street and stayed in places that would make your mother weep. And nights were warm and wine was cheap and there was no time for sleep. Too much attention paid to a career can cost you dear. Well, blood runs hot. Get out of Phoenix, Rochester, Duluth. Devour your youth. That's the truth. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are we doing a Q&A? Well, Are we yeah. just going to mingle? Or? Uh, well, let's, why don't you put, bring your chair up and you can take one of these chairs and sit there too. Yeah. And we'll see. Thanks. Please ask any questions to either or both. I have a question. What uh, is Dahini in uh, the piece you read? Sort of like your angel. <laughs> uh -huh. your, uh, the Sanskrit word. Dakini is a complicated history because Dakinis originally were fierce feminine entities that would tear you apart if you got too close to them. And then um, Buddhist took the concept over and turned it into a much more complex entity where there could be enlightened Dakinis and then the others were not the enlightened Dakinis. And they, um, they, they, they could be in some contexts protectors, in other contexts they are inspirers, um, but they're always more in the angelic realm than mm -hmm. in any other realm, yeah. Mm. yeah. But they're, they, C connection with them is, is beneficial, let's put it that way, if you can manage it. If you can. They convey a certain blessing. Well, they can, <laughs> yeah, they can. If I get not, that. If they're not the ones that tear you apart, then... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but there was a line in one of your poems that really resonated with me. I think it was, I get stranger every day, uh -huh. according to me. Yeah. <laughs> Except mine was, I get stranger every day, according to my wife. <laughs> that too, Similar. Yeah. About some re reverb with your preverb. <laughs> I have a question. Um, I know one of my teachers said you can't have any freedom without restriction. And I like your idea of having just one page, you know, yeah. choosing one page and going from one side to the Page to the other. If you, did you uh, have different forms before? Or? Well, it's a, it's a long story, but the, I've been doing them for 20 years. And um, it started out probably as a kind of um, homage to, uh, to Blake, to Blake's problems of hell that are in the marriage of heaven and hell. I, I think that, I mean, I'm not actually sure what made them start, but they did spontaneously start. And then it just sort of kept growing and going. And, um, it, once it struck a certain kind of um, complexity of self-involvement um, in the language, they, it, it, it just internally developed. And then, they, but the first ones were like pages long. And I realized nobody would read them. <laughs> it, was just, it was too intense for pages long. So. Oh, after a period of years, they sort of spontaneously started breaking up into smaller, smaller units and finally hit the one page thing. 
and, and there were always one line. That was the basic, that for some reason established itself immediately. Because I didn't write like that previously. I wrote what I call axial poems. And axial poems were basically the same kind of thing, but they would happen in lines. And then suddenly it all pulled together in a single line. And, um, <clears throat> there's a, a principle in physics that uh, a, a nanophysicist friend of mine who teaches at UCLA, but has now moved near us in Hudson Valley, um, he called it self-organized criticality. And self-organized criticality it means, well, you know what criticality means? Like water always turns to ice at a certain temperature, or it always evaporates at a certain temperature. That's criticality. So there's a critical mass point. Self-organized criticality is where you cannot predetermine what that point will be. And that seems like it might be an unusual phenomenon, but it's actually very common. The weather is a self-organized criticality. You'll never get a perfect prediction of weather. It's always a kind of based on parameters that are get better and better. They get better and better at doing it, but it can't be consistently accurate. The international economy is one of those. That you, you really, it's impossible to develop principles that will predict what it will do. Economists kind of bluff you and pretend that they have a handle on all that. The brain turns out to have activity that is self-organized. So once he told me this principle, I started thinking about it, I realized that I had experienced that, that these things developed and then suddenly the next day, they were always going to be one page. I had no, I, I had no reason. I, I mean, I can make up reasons like you know, whatever, but it, they really didn't have a reason. So then I realized that the whole project was about doing what I could not explain, but which had the force of its own self-determination. Because I don't decide those lines. I don't sit around and construct them. They come, I write them down, and often when I write them down, I, I think, this is crazy. But I, the principle is I have to write it down exactly as it comes. I might mess with it a little later and make it clearer, but I can't actually change its nature. That's, that's kind of like the rule, because that rule permits me to respect the process of, it, of how they come. And so I actually feel that that's how, that's the, that is the self-regulatory aspect of us. If we can really trust what our being tells us, because actually you know what's good for you and not good for you. I, I was demonstrating what's called uh, kinesiology to uh, Charles today where your body knows what's good for you and isn't good for you. I can prove it to you in, in, in two minutes with um, uh, showing you how, how muscle testing. You, you always, it's always right. And there are many, many uh, health professionals who use it as a, as a basis for determining. But it's the same idea, that if you could just trust this way that you already know, or that something is knowing for you, and it doesn't have to be a mystical level. If you wanted to, if you Think of it that way, it can be that way. But it's not actually, it's no more mystical than life. I mean, I guess life is mystical in that sense, but I mean, it's a mystery. You cannot determine it. Um, so that, that's how it developed. <laughs> and when I actually talked about it to this uh, nanophysicist friend of, of mine, um, he totally agreed that this was an instance of it, that the way they had developed, some months later or years later, Suddenly, they started taking on titles. They didn't have titles. We said numbers. And then, how long would they are going to be? Well, that also is self determining. So, you know. Andrew, mm. some of the work you read made me think that you have a background of reading, maybe studying um, historical ballads, Scottish ballads, and different kinds of mm. narrative poetry that can be quite complex in how it weaves its way. Mm. Is there something of that in your... Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, um, I've, I've been a folk singer since the 60s, and uh, at school was often in groups that, you know, would do, like, child's ballads and those sorts of things. So over the years, I've done just hundreds and hundreds of folk songs from places like the British Isles 
yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's an influence. Yeah. Andrew. Yeah. Uh, I read a lot of your poetry, and uh, I don't have much knowledge in this area, but I would say I've always been impressed by sort of freestyle, non-rhyming non uh, approach that you take to the various forms of things. Mm. I'm surprised at how much rhyming type poetry is this. Does this go along with the puppets? Or? Uh, I suppose. I mean, I, I um, you know, I'll get on these kicks of doing, doing uh, little, you know, ballad-like things. And I've, I've always been a fan of light verse. Uh, you know, Grandpa Myron used to send me poems by Ogden Nash when I was mm. probably eight or nine years old, going off to camp. Um, and... Uh, so, you know, poetry is such a big tent. I mean, there's, there's so many things that are called poetry. And uh, this was meant to be a kind of living room show that would, you know, have a fair amount of variety in it, um, but lots of just fun as well. Uh, and hopefully, um, you know, even the, the, the fairly, you know, rhythmic um, rhyming pieces have a sort of point to them where you kind of go, uh, you yeah, know, that's it's not just fluff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a mailing list um, so that you can keep up with what you're doing? Uh, yes. Yes, I, I'm going to start that tomorrow. So <laughs> if you want to... Um, there's a sheet of paper there that has the price uh, prices of my books written on it. Just give me your email, and I will do that. And now that um, now that things are opening up a little bit from COVID, hopefully they'll really open up. Um, I hope to get back on the road with this. I made it so that I could tour it in a Prius, and um, I, I basically will do shows in people's living rooms. Uh, backyards, basements, uh, for just passing the hat. Um, but they have to put me up overnight and give me dinner. <laughs> and actually, it's worked out very well. Uh, and it's a lot of fun. It's intimate. And yeah, so um, I'm happy to so, put you so on the list. We're, we're going back to Montreal next week. For oh, uh, Great. How about to Montreal? Yeah, to that's that's just a day trip for me. Oh. <laughs> yeah. We love it. Another question. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, how did you get started in puppetry? I was a theater major. Mm -hmm. I'd always liked puppets, you know, as a kid, but then um, I ran into the work of Peter Schumann and Bread and Puppet Theater, and they were doing stuff that was not at all howdy doody. Uh, <laughs> And I thought, this is really fabulous. So I had a directing class. Two of us were assigned the same plays, which were from the Wakefield cycle of medieval kind of mystery plays. And I thought these would be perfect for puppets, big puppets. And, you know, once you start, it's, it's hard to stop. So I was um, working with various theater companies and puppet companies. And then over time, I just, uh, you know, started full-time touring as a puppeteer and my wife and I ended up doing that for several decades as our our main work. You never know. One thing leads to another and here you are, just turned 70 and what happened? <laughs> it was me and the puppets. Sure. I had a couple questions. So I'll, I'll ask the long historical one first. No. Just that when you emerged as a poet worker in this field in the mid to late 60s, you know, uh, there it seems like that was a really rich time in terms of what was going on uh, nationally, internationally in poetry with 
Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, the, the, even though it had begun in the 50s, the beats were still strong. The Black Mountain poets, uh, the New York School poets, there were a lot of people that were, you know, not just trying to write good poems, but had whole world views that, mm -hmm. that, that were challenging. Uh, in, in the poetry world in different ways. And I, I, I guess I wonder if you, what part of that you uh, occupied in a way, but also how do you see that in respect to now 50 years later and what's going on? Well, I mean... You have to write a book to answer this, of course. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I have to. But, um, I mean, I... I don't. I had nothing to do with determining my being a poet. It was not influenced by any of that. I that I think I told you earlier that I, it was just a spontaneous event that sparked that. But when I got to New York, I'd been living in Europe at that point, and I came to New York, got finally did a degree so I could make a living, and I ended up teaching, getting a job teaching at Stony Brook and all that. So um, when I was in New York as a student. I tried to go to every poetry reading that happened in the city, all over the city. And I realized right away that culturally, poetry was highly polarized at that time, with sort of the way politics are now. I mean, but it was, it was, it was what we'll call the poetry wars. And um, the, I was probably initially more aligned with the mainstream, because I was reading T.S. Eliot and Wallace Stevens and poets like that. But as an undergraduate, I just happened to start going to the poetry which is the Lower East Side in Manhattan. And uh, that, was a, that was the radical scene. And I, at first it was extremely upsetting to me because there were things that I couldn't understand why people were calling this poetry. And, um, but I kept going. And eventually, one day I was walking, I was studying at NYU and I was walking on Waverly Place and I, suddenly it just hit me that I could no longer deny that my life had been changed by these so-called radical poets, I, that they had changed how I think about poetry, that I would never be able to escape. That poetry was something that you couldn't predetermine the nature of. And that the mainstream in literature was constantly trying to, to say what that was. Whereas these other poets were doing what they thought they had to do that this was something that was uh, needed by the nature of what we are. It wasn't about uh, proving something culturally or establishing a position. It was about realizing something that was fundamental to the nature of being human. And that just changed entirely my view of what poetry and literature are supposed to be. So, I mean, I, I still hold the view, which is that uh, this is about discovering what the nature of a being is, of what it is to be alive, what it is to, what are what, what is being asked of us by the fact of our being alive. Why am I doing this? I mean, that's the famous sort of Heideggerian thing. Why is there something instead of nothing? I mean, that's a bit, that's the basic question. Why is there something instead of nothing? Is it because God intended it, or because whatever you know? And and so that question is sort of at the root of, I think, the, the poetic act. Poesis just means to make. And, 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 and that's a very fundamental impulse in human beings, to make something. You almost can't imagine not making something. It, and I think a lot of people make trouble because they couldn't think of anything else to make. But they're making at least trouble. <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question, but you had a second Yeah, that's fine. Uh, the second one was a little more nitty gritty. And that was just a, a, some of the of the pieces you read, I've been reading recently, and and so I have my book next to me, and I even read along with part of one, and I noticed there were just moments when you, your emphasis was on a word that made it a verb, whereas I had read it as a noun. Yeah. And then I, but then I realized, well, you can do that either way. So, do you feel like when you're reading, you're limiting it more? Than when oh, it's absolutely. on the page. Look, when I first started doing these, I thought, finally, I created a kind of poetry that cannot be read aloud to people. <laughs> I mean, I thought, now I've really gone and done it. I've in, ended my career, whatever that might be, as a, as a 
public person. <laughs> and then I gave a reading at uh, St. Mark's in the, on the east side, and um, it kind of worked. And uh, I found a way of doing it. It was different from how we do it now. But um, it, well, let's see. the emphasis is momentary. Mm -hmm. And this has to do with the nature of reading. There's no way that I can read those lines so that they fulfill their different possibilities. I, I can sometimes read them so that you feel the pull of meaning going in one direction. But for a lot of people, that's just confusing in a negative way, you know, because they just, for some reason, we, listen, we got the idea when we were in school that we're supposed to understand poetry and we're supposed to be able to interpret it and analyze it. And I think this was a major harm to human beings. In fact, I think the education in poetry, it, in, in my experience, was very counterproductive much of the time because the emphasis is on mastering the thing that you're reading. But that's not how poetry gets written. It doesn't get written in order to convey a meaning. It's a state of attention, a state of mind that works the mind differently, that opens the mind to different orders of, of, of receptivity to language. I mean, language doesn't belong to anybody. It belongs to everybody. I mean, it's a kind of all or nothing reality, but we don't think of it that way. We think we're supposed to master it because we've, we've been educated to think that we're supposed to understand, master, and be right about it. Mm -hmm. So people are, are intimidated by poetry because they, they, they don't understand that it's a state of freedom, a state of freedom to reconstruct reality on the spot and in an enjoyable way, in a way that belongs to you. And so getting that impulse out of people so that they can, that has been hammered into them, intimidating them, is I think the, the major educational task of poetry. So I try to create a, a work that gives more freedom of choice because I think that's what wakes the mind up to its own possibility. And I think it's very fundamental. I think that we, we construct our lives and reality and our views and our politics and all that out of thinking that we can determine the truth. But then we stop listening to each other. We stop being aware that things can reorder themselves spontaneously when we give it that kind of space. So how can we create that, that state of mind? And that's, I think, the poet's question, the poet's job, or the artist's job. Yeah. I mean, it, not just the poet, but anybody who makes something creatively. Well, I, I think we're supposed to be out of here in eight minutes, but I'm sure nobody's going to come and hurt us if we're not. But maybe take one more question. If someone has one. Did you have one, David? Yours? There's cake also. <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> more important. I don't take cake. Well, they're, they're not. They that's like us. Job. And we can, uh, yeah. Well, thank you. We can mingle, we can mingle, yeah. we can chat. Yes.